YouTubers, welcome back. Um, you've been watching us tear down the Viper engine, you've seen the damage to the block. The block's no good, <laughs> crank is questionable. Uh, so we had to think of something to do to get this car going again. So here's my solution. This is going to be my new Gen 2 Viper engine. I met this guy down in Houston and um, put all these parts for him. So we're going to be cleaning them up, putting them together, and uh, you'll just see how a Viper engine goes together. Cool. All right, so I went ahead and mocked up the engine, the bare engine. You saw this thing was in pieces in the back of my uh, Jeep SRT. I went ahead and oiled everything down, cleaned things up a bit, got some of the carbon off the tops of the pistons. I'm going to be polishing these things later. Pulled the rings off. All the rings are stored over here in the respective receptacle, keeping everything straight, mostly for organization so you can kind of see what's going on here. And I measured the deck height of each of these pistons at top dead center. And from the factory, these pistons typically come about 30 thousandths in the hole. Here you can see I'm measuring 35 thousandths, 36, 38 thousandths, 40, and 42. So, right, so you can see we've got some slope to the deck height of our uh, Viper block. So we're going to be machining this block flat. Uh, so it's going to be the same number out here as it does out here. That keeps the compression ratio even across all five cylinders. We are also going to be taking uh, about 30 thousandths off. My goal is to leave these pistons somewhere between 5 and 10 thousandths in the hole. Um, that's approximately the width of a head gasket that we're going to be removing from the top deck of this engine. That's going to give us a tighter squinch area, uh, more compression ratio, cleaner combustion, more power. Okay, so what is that squinch area? All right, well basically what it is, is you can see these have heart-shaped combustion chambers. And when that piston comes up against the top of the cylinder head here, with of course the head gasket in place, we want these areas here and here to be right against the pistons. Just enough room so that the piston doesn't smack it when you're doing 6,000 RPMs. There's always a little bit of rock in the piston, so you have to account for that as well. So typically, um, depending on what kind of engine you're putting together, we're shooting for around 35 thousandths or so of gap, including the head gasket. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more conservative with this engine. I'm probably going to go for about 40 thousandths, you know, just to make sure we don't have any problems. Right. When you get this quench set real tight, then all this gas, uh, fuel, and air in here gets squished out into the main combustion chamber at the very last microsecond, introducing more swirl, more turbulence, and of course, uh, a more complete combustion. It also helps to lower your octane requirements so you can run more compression without getting into detonation or pre ignition. So that's what I'm doing with the quench get this deck surface parallel to the floor and we'll spin the crank around. Look how easy this thing spins around. There's no rings in there, but this is what you want. I mean, if you can't do this by hand, something's wrong with your crankshaft and rod setup. So anyway, we're going to spin this around, get our number seven piston, easily accessible. Okay, these aren't that tight. And you want to catch it. You don't want that rod banging around inside your cylinders. There's 
number seven. Uh, I just want to show you guys something. This is piston number two here. And of course this engine came out of a 97 Viper and it was supercharged. I don't know if you guys can see this. There you can see uh, bearings getting a little bit worn right through there. And I'm trying to show that. There you go, right there. Now you can see it right through there. Right in there. See a big old scuffed area right there. And that's not the worst of them, but that's what supercharging does. There's the upper side here. Oh man, you can't miss that one, can you? Look at that scuff mark right there in the middle. You know, so we had a little bit of detonation on this bad boy. Scuffed the bearings good. All right, here's the number four piston. And likewise, got scuffed pretty good all through there. Um, I guess these are tri-metal bearings. You can see the original metal out here, a different metal there, then a third metal on the inside. I think these things are supposed to have copper underneath or something, so I don't see any copper yet. Well, maybe a little bit right through there. Might, might be a little copper showing. But uh, yeah, that's what detonation does. Alright, so this is my old crank out of the engine. This is when I toasted. You can see how black this number one and two ride journal is through here. There's some crud, some bearing material stuck on the crankshaft itself. That's not pretty. I don't know if it's going to be safe or not, but listen one. to this. Two. Ah. One. Two. Crank is cracked right here. So this piece is officially junk. So I'm going to use this thing here to practice my drilling technique on. Okay, so here's that bad crankshaft again. I just want to show you how the oil um, passages line up on this crankshaft. This is the main bearing. This is the number one main bearing, number two, number three main bearing. Uh, this is the number one, two, three, four rod journals. You can see here on the number two main bearing, I can insert this piece of welding wire and it goes right through the number three uh, rod journal. From over here, I can do the same thing. Insert this welding wire. Oops, wrong way. Try it again. Insert this welding wire. Oh no, I'm not going to be able to show you. Oh, that has to be the right angle. There we go. That was hitting the uh, uh, crankshaft uh, position wheel. So here you again, the number three main going to the number four rod bearing. And the number two main going to the number three rod bearing. So the three, four is a common point of failure on these engines. Of course, we toasted this one here up front, if you know why. Um, but yeah, we're going to be performing this oiling mod to increase our oil flow to the rod. Alright, so went at Home Depot, bought a brand new DeWalt bit. This is a 17 64 bit, which is what I need for a 5 16 tap. Okay. So I want to improve this one here. So it exits out here. So this is the one I'm going to work on. Because it's closer. Come on. Some hard steel. Okay, so the way a crankshaft is set up 
is this call this the main of the crankshaft, the main bearing surface. And we're going to have a crankshaft or a rod throw out here where two rods are going to ride. Kind of like that. And then, of course, there'll be another main out here. Okay. So these cranks are drilled from the rod through this arm out here to the main bearing. So let me see if I can draw this line. It's not going to be perfectly accurate. Excuse me if I go into free space here. But something like that. So the drill the cross like that. And these crank throws are also straight drilled from the top all the way through. Okay. So it's actually an intersection right here between the straight drill part and the part that comes out here to oil the rod throw. Okay. On a small block Chevy, they just drill down and they intersect. The cranks are drilled through and through. And small block Chevys are known for their excellent oiling. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be getting a plug of metal and we're going to be driving it, actually we'll be driving it from this side. We're going to be driving it through this hole, past here, to block this passage. So that when the oil is fed into this chamber, it's diverted straight to the rods and it doesn't go all the way through to oil the other side of the main. This will decrease oiling to your mains, increase oiling to your rods. Um, these mains are also drilled perpendicularly, so each main is going to get two plugs inserted. Alright, so anyway, this here is the number two main bearing, and you can see one of the holes that uh, is drilled through the main throw. Uh, these are pin gauges, and I've bought several of these in different sizes. I've got some .248s, some .250s, and some .252s. This is a 250, and it slides in pretty easy. The 248, of course, even more easy. I can feel a little interference fit, not much. Alright, here's my plug of 252. If I were to insert this, it gets stuck. Okay? It will not go as is. It's just a tight fit. It's only two thousandths bigger than this one, but it is snug. There we go. So this is the one I'm going to use. I do not want this guy to come out, so this is the guy. I went ahead and cut off about uh, two-thirds of an inch, and I've got it chilling in the freezer right now. It's been chilling overnight. So uh, first thing to get this thing ready for the pounding is to clean that hole with some acetone and a wire brush. We want to make sure we get the Loctite something good to stick to. Uh, I got some acetone here. Just gonna clean that out real well. All right. I've got a one eighth inch punch that I'm going to use to drive the pin into place. And that hole, that cross drilling is right there. So I'm really only have to go about halfway in with this punch 
and my piece of pin gauge will have cleared that other chamfer, that other cross drilling to the number, oh, what is this, number two rod through. Okay, so we'll um, run to the freezer, pull it out, and see if we can tap this guy in place. Oh, let's get the Loctite ready, that's important. All right, guys. Permatex, high strength, red thread locker. This is the stuff you need. Don't get the blue stuff. You don't want to mess around with this. Get the red. All right, I just pulled my little dowel pin gauge out of the freezer. Like I said, it's been chilling all night long. It's about two thousandths too big. Throw a little thread locker on there. Or a lot. Alright, let's see. Here we go. Ah, still Spinner broke off and cut me. All right, so now I'm going to try to pin this number three. One, two, three. Yep. I said this. Uh, this one measures two five zero. Is the one that tends to bind in this one. Let's see how I do here. It wants to get stuck right there at the uh, at the cross drilling. Well, cross drilling like the slant drilling. Well, that one wasn't super tight. And knock it on through and then try the 252. Let's do that. a section of 252 pin and we're not going to show this one. The 250 went through pretty easy. So I'm just going to coat this thing with a bunch of Loctite. I've got a small chamfer on one end. I want to insert it and let's see if this thing will drive the place. <clears throat> See how it goes. Well, that feels pretty good. Certainly live with. 
with that. That's nice. All right, so now I've got the number two and the number three broad journal pinned. Okay, one important thing to mention is that when you're pinning your crank, uh, not all of these main journals are uh, cross drilled uh, perpendicularly to each other. Definitely, this number two is boom and boom. You can see the two holes here. But look at number three. Three is just straight across. And so you know, they feed opposing journals on the rods. Number four, straight across, boom, boom. Number five is cross drilled. Okay. Um, but number six, again, you just straight across, no cross drilling. It's on the end. Same thing with number one, it's on the end. So the only ones you really need to pin are your number two mains and your number five mains. Those are the ones that will uh, mess up your rod pressure. Because I'm not aware of any issues with the, what is it, uh, eight and nine rods. It's always the two and three right here. These are the ones that always give you problems, specifically the three, four, this journal here. All right, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, that piece of metal is still on my finger and it's in there pretty deep. So we're gonna try to cut it out of there. Mr. Yeah, yeah, it's like a little. Yeah. I don't know how deep it is. Um. Maybe it's kind of bleedy. It's kind of hard to see. It's a little bleedy, yeah. It's been swelling for 24 hours now. Sore. Something that I think is still a little deep. Still down in the two foot too deep. <laughs> you look like I'm sewing something. There you go. I saw part of it move. I saw something black move. I see something there. I see yeah. something. Uh -huh. Something's there. It's a big piece. I can hear like a little crunch then. 
Wow, it's so small. That thing was like a bullet into my finger. Look at that, that little thing. That little piece there. Cool. Thank you.